Hello, hello, and welcome to the sixth episode of Soccer 60. Slam Hari Raya, guys. Eid Mubarak to those who are celebrating. Um, what is Soccer 60? Soccer 60 is a youth football podcast where we bring you coaches and those in the industry to get to know them more and to dissect the industry as a whole. Towards the end of the show, we'll be answering some of your questions. So don't forget to send us your questions over at our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on Facebook and Instagram. In this podcast, your usual suspects are myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston, and today we have coach of the FCKL U11s and U13s, Chris Dayton. How are you guys doing? Good. Yeah, very well, very thanks, good. Henry. It sounds like you had a very cheerful weekend. That was a very lively start to the podcast. Yeah, I uh, I have some coffee today in our Soccer 60 uh, mug, uh, and uh, I got a haircut, which is great. Uh, <laughs> Who cut your hair? Oh, my dad. I actually went back home this weekend, so... Um, uh, my dad was like, "You look, you need a shave," um, and he actually bought clippers for himself. So he, so he tells me this story on how he clips his hair every two to three days. Um, and I'm like, "All right, great to know that. Uh, I just need one haircut for the next and, two months." And Chris, before you came on, Henry explained yeah. to me why he was wearing that T-shirt rather than the standard issue uh, 2020 Little League shirt that we're supposed to be wearing. And he blamed it on jet lag coming back from his parents' house from Puchong. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, I, I, what, I, that's what you're yeah. dealing with on this podcast, I'm afraid, Chris. Yeah, Puchong, yeah, and, Puchong him, and Santol are two different extremes. No, I asked him understand. yesterday, yeah. where, where is he coming from? Because he was going to pass me the mic. And uh, he said he's not in KL until 7 o'clock. And I'm guessing, where can you go in during this... CMCO, right? And then I'm, I, I was thinking it must be, must be Puchong and Puchong is in KL, more or less, yeah. right? More or less. <laughs> yeah. There might be some people to get upset by that statement, Chris. Uh, all, yeah, Puchong people, all Puchong people will go, hey, no, 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 Puchong is not in KL. <laughs> but then we leave that debate to another day because we're going mo- gonna to move on uh, to some Little League news. Andy? Yeah, got a few things going on this week as always. Uh, we've added a, a new shopping platform to our website. Um, so there's new ways to pay via online bank transfer. So um, check out that if you want to get on uh, last orders for the whiteout jerseys. Um, also on the website, look out this week. We've got some new promotions coming with some of our partners, some, some discounts for you to in, enjoy and some partner promotions. So look out for that later this week. Uh, our very own coach Chris, who's on the podcast today, has written an article for our website um, regarding five top tips for home training. Um, so if you're if you're training at home and you're trying to keep up your fitness levels during this MCO period, then do take a look at that. There's some really useful advice from Coach Chris. Uh, our online sessions are continuing. Um, we mentioned last week that the free sessions had switched from Wednesday to Thursday. So have a look at, at Thursday this week for our free online session brought to you by Coach Nidal. And then Saturday and Sunday mornings, 9 to 10 a.m. as well. So do have a look at those things. Um, Coach Nidal has started a brand new mini maestro program, which he's, uh, which he's termed his online session. So that's interesting. And, and the interest in those um, sessions is, is growing week by week. So do have a look at those. They're, they're worthwhile doing during this period. Um, and that's about it, I think, from, from Little League. Uh, as always, don't forget to subscribe to our, our channel and our podcast. Um, send Henry all the abuse that you want. Um, uh, what I mean by that is feedback on how you thought the the show went. But please send it to Henry. Don't send it to Chris or I. Um, and uh, send any recommendations for what you might like to see. Henry, that's about it. Yep. Uh, for more information, don't forget to go on to www.littleleague.my. Now we will move on swiftly to the start of the show. And every start of the show... For the last five episodes, we've been asking the same question and we'll ask the same question to Chris as well. Chris, explain that kit. Okay, um, well, this kit, um, I don't own, to be honest, I don't own uh, many jerseys. And uh, when Henry asked me to wear a jersey that means some, something to me, it's a difficult, difficult thing for me to do. So, um, so I just went through my wardrobe and I found this jersey. And, um, Chris, this what jersey is it? Is, sorry? What is it? What, what do you mean? What jersey is it? I can't see. Oh, okay. Um, this jersey is actually from uh, this small club in Spain, FC Vargas. Um, I got this jersey as a souvenir from them uh, when I was with uh, Turf City when we went there for a series of friendly match. And uh, this was our last stop before we head back to Singapore at that time. So um, why I chose this jersey is basically I remember um, um, 
the the club was being i mean they were they were very very um, friendly people there in the club it's a very very small club in uh, near the toledo uh, area and uh, the people were friendly the coaches the players and the club staff very very nice people and the hospital hospitality there was just amazing compared to the two pro clubs that we went before that uh leganes and getafe they, they were these guys were super super so um so i keep this jersey although they don't have they, it's not a very nice um designed but i just like it because of the memory i have there you know mm. i have yeah. an alternative theory as to why that might be your favorite shirt chris why is that because it was free <laughs> <laughs> any anybody that knows coach chris knows that he he values and takes care of his money extremely well so <laughs> if anyone wants to give him a free t-shirt i suspect it might be his new favorite jersey tomorrow Yeah, yeah. Actually, to be honest with you, I went through my wardrobe. I've got a few jerseys. I don't know. If, I don't have many, but all of them are actually gift. Yeah, I don't. That does I, not no, surprise me one bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and we move on swiftly. Uh, we know just a bit of uh, Coach Chris from that explanation from Andy just now about his kid. But we go, we dive deeper into Coach Chris's story. So, um, Chris, why don't you yep. give a um. Brief, brief background of yourself and how you got yourself into football. Well, um, okay. Um, from what I can remember, I started uh, getting in, in, into football or started to like football when I, during the 1994 uh, World Cup. Um, uh, I was eight year old back then, um, and then uh, it was my uncle who's uh, who's a big football fan who keep talking about uh, Brazil and Romario at that time. You know, to me and my cousin. Um, and that's how I started to know about football and uh, showed interest in it. Um, and then just normal, uh, played at home with my cousin, nothing too structured or just, you know, 1v1s, a lot of 1v1s and just playing in the park, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. And then um, when I really got into football is when I was probably 10 or 11, um, where I would play football with my friends in school during recess and after school uh, every day. So ever since then, I just got hooked into it. Yeah. Did you did you like play? How do I put it? Um, did you play for your school, or uh, did, were you selected to play for school back then? Yes, yes. Uh, in primary school, I did. Uh, when I was twelve, uh, I played for my school, um, and then in during my secondary sc- uh, years, uh, I got selected again when I was sixteen. Mm. So yeah, yeah, I did. Was was that uh, so? That's quite interesting because like, um, uh, did you go into? Did you ask the 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 school teacher like if there's a football club to join, or was the t- did the teacher approach you and go, uh, can you play for the school? Oh no, no, no it's no. just a typical uh, old-fashioned way, you know. Um, school trial, all the kids come, you go through one or two rounds, and uh, mm. that's about it. That's not even training at that time, you know. So you just go and uh, play. You just play. Yeah, you just play. Uh, yeah, see, Henry, Henry, Henry's Henry's asking because he wasn't even invited to the trials. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> But Chris, like th- this was in KL, right? That you were growing up. Yes, yes, yeah. Was was there any at that time? Was there any um, private clubs that you could join outside of the school or anything no. like that? No, not at all, not at all, not that I know of. Uh, I think towards the um, towards when I was in secondary school, maybe towards when I was fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, around that age. Yeah, there were probably one, two uh, of uh, private academies uh, at that time. But obviously, at that time. Private academy is quite luxurious, quite uh, exclusive. So yeah. Mm. Mm. Um. So over here, right? Uh. Then we go into the advancements of your career. Um, coaching, I think, was not the first choice that you had. Um. Mm-mm. Before you came into coaching, you were doing something else, weren't you? Uh, you were studying something else. Yes. 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 I was. Um. <laughs> so okay. After my form five, uh, I went to study in a college in KL. Uh, I did uh, a certificate course in advertising. Okay. And I dropped out after a year because I just didn't like it. I just couldn't. Uh, I couldn't cope with it, so I didn't like it. Um. And then after that, I joined a furniture import export company where I was working in the logistics department when I was nineteen. Um. After that, uh, after for a while, I realized that I. Uh, I w- I can't be doing this forever, so I I started to feel really really depressed about it. Uh, okay. Then I then I asked a few people for their advice, um, and they gave me um, uh, advice pretty much the same thing. They said that I should be doing what I love and what I am passionate about. You know, so the answer is quite simple: it's football. So, yeah. I think if if we go back to um, the very first episode that we recorded with Shazwan, we we were talking there about 
um, people that become coaches without having necessarily played at a high level of football. And obviously, Chris, you fit into that that category as well. Um, you, you didn't play football to, to any particular um, level of notoriety, but obviously, you, you know, you played it as you got older and what have you. But what was it that made you think that you could become a coach without that, that playing experience? Well, actually, I didn't think I could become a coach, you know. Um, well, um, I knew my level. Uh, I wasn't a really good player. Even back in school, I wasn't a really good player. Um, but I just wanted to get involved with football. Um, and when, I, when I decided to, to quit that job in the office, um, I knew that my, I'm not going to go back into playing professionally or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to go into it, not going back, sorry. So, um, so I just wanted to be involved with football uh, one way or another. And, um, and then the option of the idea of um, coaching just came into me. So I just thought I'll just give it a try first, you know. So yeah, that's how I thought about it. Mm. Uh, this will be a link back to last week's episode with uh, Coach Simon because um, your first job mm-hmm. was with the Goal Academy. Yes. Um, uh, could you just tell us a little bit of your experience there because that was your very first time starting out as a coach. Yeah. Um, so basically when I was um, working in that office uh, job, right? Um, af- and then after that, I bef- before that actually, I, went, I, I enrolled myself into a, a sports science course with a... Um, but a part-time sports science course, um, and then in the, during in the meantime, I was looking for a part-time uh, coaching job as well, mm-hmm. and then I just went on um, Google search for a job, and I came across this um, academy, which is the Goal Academy in PJ, um, and I um, what do you say? I I emailed them, uh, and then they ha- they offered me a part-time. Uh, uh, job uh, working on the weekends and that's how I went into it and then one year later they uh, offered me a full-time job and I stayed there for five years so that's how I got into that yeah okay uh, and after f- after that it was with uh, Little League yes so after with the Goal Academy for five years I joined Little League uh, yes from 2015 I think it was 2015 if I'm not wrong yeah, two thousand fifteen. Uh, how how did that come about? Like, how did you guys find about find find out about Little League at that point in time? How did I find out about Little League? Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, it was through Coach Philip. Um, I mean, I knew about uh, Little League uh, before that. You know, I mean, mm. Little League has been around for so long. Um, yep. So yep. I knew about them, but after uh, my stint with uh, the Goal Academy about five years, I actually wasn't planning to go. Um, I wasn't. I, I was actually a, a little bit. Um, not sure of what I want to do after that. Um, so I decided to go and uh, do my coaching course in um, Singapore at that time, my AFCB license. And uh, I was in contact with Philip and, uh, and then Philip said, uh, he's look, uh, Little League is looking for a coach. Would I be interested to join? Uh, that's when I decided to uh, join Little League. So after my coaching course. Yeah. And speaking of unplanned, actually, uh, it was a very good transition to the next point, which we're going to talk about, uh, which is Singapore. Um, Singapore was a little bit unorthodox for you because I don't you, you kind of you kind of had it was a decision that just dropped in and you just without without saying anything just went for it right could you just explain yeah. to us more about your story on Singapore and how it happened in the, at the start okay um this is in 2016 so um after a year plus or a year a year with Little League I remember I was um to- I, I spoke to Shazwan and Andy uh, and I told them that I'm looking for a new challenge in uh, coaching. So, um, I mean, I'm the type of person that I need challenge. I, I, I like new environment. I like, um, I don't like being stagnant. Mm. So uh, I spoke to Shazwan and Andy and, um, and I was very eager to, to go somewhere, to move out of my comfort zone um, uh, and to grow, you know. And then um, one, day, um, one day I got a call from Andy. I remember I got a call from Andy saying that uh, there's an opening in our sister club in Singapore and to become the coach for Turf City FC. So I I, can't, I don't remember how fast I gave him that answer. Uh, it's either within the same day or the next day. I can't I can't really remember, but I just jumped into the, into uh, that opportunity, and it's the best decision I've made in my uh, coaching career so far. I think yeah. Yeah, I think if I just give my little spin on that as well, because um, as Chris mentioned, uh, he he came in and worked with us for that year, twenty fifteen to twenty sixteen, and it was clear straight away that. Um, he was a, a young and talented coach, but also very ambitious. And I 
before he spoke to me about wanting a new challenge and stuff like that, I knew very much that we did not have the setup at that time to accommodate his growth. Um, we just we just weren't as big and as established as we are now, and um, there was there was uh, nothing to really keep him uh, driving forward and and growing and pushing him and challenging him ultimately. Mm. And uh, so I, I knew that we were at a risk of him moving on. Um, and when he spoke to me about wanting a new challenge, it wasn't a surprise. And then it just so happened that this opportunity ar arose in Singapore. And I remember having a conversation with Shazwan about it because Shaz wasn't very happy that I was offering Chris up to go to Singapore. <laughs> um, but the way I looked at it was like Chris was going to leave us in Malaysia to go and work for us in Singapore. And it was better to keep him in the organization somehow than, than lose him somewhere else, which was going to happen at that point for sure. Like I said, like we just weren't set up to, to cater for where he wanted to go at that time. Um, so it was better to keep him in the organization somehow. And um, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit more in the moment, but mm. Singapore was uh, a very much more challenging scenario and situation for Chris. Um, and I know for sure that he learned an awful lot during his time there. So I think it was a fantastic move for him. I think it was ultimately has benefited us now that yep. he's back working for us here. So for everybody involved, I think it was, was the best thing to be done. And, you know, maybe had a bit of a rocky path in, in between to get back to where we are now. But I think everyone's in a better position now than, than if he had just stayed and found another opportunity, you know, by himself somewhere. Mm. Agreed. Uh, that being said, Chris, um, yeah. in terms of your coaching style when you were in Malaysia and to when you were in Singapore, um, would you say that he has changed significantly? Oh yes, a lot. I changed a lot. I, I actually I learned so much uh, during my stint there. So um, everything I thought I knew before uh, when I moved to Singapore, um, I just went there. Um, I just changed. I just learned so much from. Uh, Lali, Coach Lali uh, in Turf City at that time. Mm. Um, yeah, so I just changed. I changed as a person, I changed as a coach. Um, so yeah, it's, mass it's an amazing experience for me. If you I could... Think, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think like uh, every young coach when they are first starting out, and Chris was starting out when he was with us in 2015, right? Realistically, mm, yeah. like he'd be done five years with Gold Academy, but that's nothing in coaching terms, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Every young coach when they're starting out, they need to find a mentor, I think. Um, yeah. someone that they respect someone that they look up to and someone that has equal respect back for them you know like it's no good just having someone up on a pedestal that you admire and they don't have any respect back you always need to find some kind of uh that that mentor that gives you almost like an apprenticeship there's the best way to learn you can go on all yes. the coaching courses you want you don't really learn so much from them um so i think what that's what chris found when he went to singapore he immediately found that mentor that was able to uh, pass on his experience and and guide Chris through his journey and um, that that's what made such a difference to Chris as well yep. as the environment that he was in. Mm. Yeah. Yep. If you could give us, if you could share with us a very good memory of your time in Singapore, if you have any. Well, a lot, a lot, a lot of good memories actually. Um, I mean, I would say the biggest um, thing about um, moving to Singapore is to have that opportunity to. Um, to, to go for uh, high, higher level competitions. Um, so Iber Cup, uh, Iber Cup, Estoril, Iber Cup, Cascais. So we went there twice. Um, and then um, and playing friendly matches again uh, against a uh, few Spanish teams. So these were all amazing memories because um, it just made me a better coach, you know. Mm. So um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then all the, um, uh, and the, 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 the trainings, the competitions, everything in Singapore. Yeah, so it's nice. It's, it's a lot, a lot. I, I can't really I, pick one, yeah. I think as well, on top of those things, you, you went and worked with a group of players that were far more talented than you had worked oh, yes. with prior to that. Like, no yeah. disrespect to those players that, he, that Chris had been working with. It wasn't the players' fault. It was the setup that was in place there. And yeah. the group of players that he went to work with was, was on another level to what he had experienced before. And obviously, as a coach that's trying to grow, you, you need players that you can work with as well, right? So I think that yes, makes yes. a big difference as well. So. Yeah, yeah. But that being said, um, what was that decision for you to come back to Malaysia? What made the decision for you to come back to Malaysia? Okay, here's the interesting part. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, this um, 
I mean, I didn't. Okay, just let's wait. Okay, it happened in February 2018 um, in Singapore. So uh, I came back because I had to. I came back because I had to. Uh, it's not because I wanted to. Um, so we were when I say coming back to Malaysia, I mean KL. Yeah? So uh, we were having a friendly match um, between uh, Turf City and JDT Academy at that time. Uh, after after the game, the the coach from JDT and I were just talking, and um, he asked me if I was Malaysian, and I said yes, and uh, he said if I would be interested. He asked if I would be interested to join the club uh, as an academy coach. And when opportunities like this come, and from one of the biggest club in Southeast Asia, it's difficult to say no, you know. So when that opportunity came, I was like, wow. And um, so what I what happened was um, I went in for a few meetings with JDT Academy's manage- management, uh, did a trial session with them during that period, um, and then Turf City and I discussed about the situation. Uh, then I was pretty certain that I mean after all that meetings and all that, uh, it seemed very very positive. And I was certain that I'm going to join JDT uh, when the offer comes in. Uh, it wasn't if the offer comes in; it was actually when the offer comes in. Right. Um. Then, um. Then what happened was, um, Turf City said they had to let me go, and I respected that. Uh, because uh, the club needs to move on and uh, plan their next step without me. So, one week before I was supposed to go and sign with JDT, um, something happened um, there, and I, and it didn't go through. So. I was left without a job and I came back to KL. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that is not something you want to hear uh, to yeah. in the coaching story. But um, I, that was a that was quite, I think, a big setback for you. But you bounced back rather quickly. Um, you got yourself into another academy, Destiny FC, was it? Yes, correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so... Yeah, after that happened, of course, it wasn't a very, um, I didn't feel very good about it. You know, it's a bit, uh, it was a tough period for me. So I went about two months uh, unemployed. Um, so just, uh, yeah, so I knew I had to do something. So I just decided to join the uh, new new team, Destiny. And um, yeah, I was with them for a year. Mm. And uh, w- w- would you say that within that two months, did you feel like you had to change to something else, not going back to football again after what you've gone through, or would you say that you just needed a long break and and at any time when you feel comfortable enough, you get back out again? Um, actually, I was. It was actually I was in between. I was thinking, you know, what what can I do? Uh, either I go back to coaching or I need to survive. You know, so I I, I was thinking whether maybe I'll do a grab part time. You know, I was <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> so I was thinking about few options here and there, but um. But I just kept telling myself, no, I have to stay in. Uh, I have to stay in the coaching industry. I have to stay in there, um, because I didn't come this far to just uh, give up, you know. So if I have to work part time to, to, to be, you know, to to be able to survive, then I'll do it. But I have to stick to coaching. I have to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have to stick to coaching. I think uh, this 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 is like I alluded to earlier. Um, us going through a a, a rocky or. Chris, rather, going through a rocky um, road to get back to, to, to being with us. And I think, you know, this is obviously what we're, what we're talking about. And um, don't think it, it uh, says anything to Chris's ability as a, as a coach or, you know, or professionalism or anything like that. And one good thing about being a coach is that you take your skills wherever you go. You know, mm. like you, you have those personal skills that you can go and apply somewhere if, if someone gives you a chance and what have you. And I think that the move for Chris to go from Malaysia to Singapore was something that Paul and I, I think, handled quite well. I think it was the right decision to make at the time. It was the right opportunity to offer Chris. And then I think when Chris left Turf City, it was a situation that Paul and I didn't handle well. You know, we we could have handled that a lot better. Um, It would have been like Little League was in Malaysia then was far more established. You know, it it wasn't going to be possible for Chris to continue with Turf City at that time. But it could have been possible for him to come back into Little League and, and have a, uh, you know, a, a, a position straight away. And that was something that we didn't handle very well. And you know, going back to, to the episode with Paul, 
Um, we, we spoke about how we need to improve those inter-country ties between Singapore and Malaysia, and this is a, a clear example. You know, There's going to be lots of coaches that would like that opportunity to go back and forth between the two countries, and I think it's our job to kind of facilitate that and give people the opportunities to, to experience both countries because they are completely different in terms mm. of coaching football. Um, so that's, that's something that we learned from, and you know, luckily for us that there was no permanent damage done. Chris and I were able to, to sit down and have a chat one day and we were able to uh, talk about what the, what the new program is and how the club has changed from when he was with us in 2015. And, uh, you know, we, he now sits here on our podcast uh, and we're going to go on to talk about some, some pretty interesting things that are happening at FCKO and, and amongst Little League. So it, it was a, a rocky path and probably one that we didn't need to take, but, you know, Everything happens for a reason. I'm a th firm believer of that. And I think that we're now back in a position where we are, have got a good relationship with Chris and, and we're looking to move forward and uh, try and my job now is to try and find ways to keep him motivated, keep him challenged and, and make sure we don't have to shift him off again. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you've given him quite a good challenge uh, in terms of when he's come back. Um, speaking that, to you. Yeah, uh, yeah correct. Uh, working with me for the past three, uh, three, four days to set this whole podcast up, uh, including the last hour. Uh, but like, we talk about how Chris came back, and um, I, I think would I wouldn't say within uh, really, really quickly that he's made his impact uh, felt right away. But coming back, um, you brought you 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 got yourself a bunch of uh, really talented kids. Um, in the under trials last year, uh, brought them over to Borneo Cup, uh, brought them to third place, and my, I, I, I'll add that it was one of the best campaigns I've seen uh, those boys and girls play. Um, that being said, we want to talk more to uh, in in the next uh, segment right now. We're moving swiftly into the next segment, which is our topic of the hour, our topic of the episode. And this this episode, we're going to talk about bringing players to the next level. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of. Um, Good success stories from from your end, Chris. Uh, from particularly from your group, uh, we've got a few players. Like um, right now, currently, some of your players have approached you and talked to you about how they want to play in the next level. You've also got a player um, who went into the academy Mokta Dahari last year. Uh, he's still playing there, and he was touted as one of the rising stars uh, to be playing right now. Uh, but I, I, I want to know more about your thought process on how you bring um, uh, kids to the next level. Do they usually approach you for it or do you look at them and go, these boys, this, this, this kid, uh, boy or girl, can actually go into the next level and you would treat him as such? It's very rare for players to approach me uh, mm. in a private academy um, scenario uh, or, or situation. Um, but yes, I do. I do uh, look out for players who has some potential, um, who I think um, might be able to make it uh, based on their profile as a player. Um, so, yeah. But uh, very rare, very rare that uh, players will come to me and say, "Coach, I want to be. Um, I want to make it to the next level." Unless I ask them. Unless I ask them. So um, yeah, yeah. It's like that. But I but think this is. I think this is a, a coach's job and I think this is an important lesson for, for young coaches to listen out for is that your job as a coach is to improve the player to the best of your ability. And if that means that they improve to beyond the level of the team that you are coaching, you need to find a way to move them on. You know, you see it a lot with, with young coaches or inexperienced coaches. They get a player that's really good, better than their team, and they do everything they can to hang on to them because it's going to make them look good as a coach, right? Right. But the, the objective should always be to push that player the same way that Chris was talking about him needing a new challenge as a coach. You need to look for that for your players. And if you see someone that's standing out and performing well, you need to look, right, where, where do they need to be placed? To, to be able to have an extra challenge. I think that's what, what Chris does well. Um, you know, when, when there's players that are shining in his team, it's not about keeping hold of them so that his team goes on and does well and he looks good as a coach. It's about, right, let's let's push them to where they can actually excel and, and play to the top of their ability. And that's that's mm. crucial. Yeah. Uh, apart, apart from that as well, in terms of a crucial role that is being played by the coach, what is a crucial role that should be played by the private academies who have these players who are supposed to move on to the next level? Um, well, in my opinion, um, 
I mean like what Andy was saying right um, private academies unless you have a um, first team uh, in the senior level um, playing in the competitive league a national league in the country uh, if you have that unless you have that otherwise you is your job is to make sure that the players be the best they can be and um, try to push them out to a better level that's all um, and what about you yeah i mean like look this is this is something i think that private academies get caught up in the wrong side of this argument too many times like mm -hmm. i would be far more proud if we have uh in five ten years time five six x little league fckl players representing malaysian teams or the malaysian national team even yeah i'd be so much more proud of that than if we win an under 14 air asia junior league title right that, that means it means nothing right it's about developing these young kids developing these players and i think there's far too many academies that are in it for the here and now Right. right, let's right. win something yep. now. It's like it's not about that. It's if there's kids that can play at a high level, they need to go to that higher level. It's as simple as that. Right, uh, Chris. Yeah. Do you think that um, now with with um, players like Ideal last year, um, we you 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 kind of had a hunch that he was going to go somewhere, right? Uh, mm. And it's not going to be with us. He's going to go to a higher level. Um, did you have a difference on which, in your opinion? Do you think that you had a difference in terms of treatment uh, or, or do you assimilate him together with the team and then, you know, eventually, even though he's the, he's the one that is standing out, your team grows together? How, how, how do you approach players like this, Chris? Well, I don't, I'm, I might treat them a little bit, a little, I would say very little differently. Um, because why? Um, well, this is how I work and this is how I feel um, this would work with the players. It's like... Um, for me, right, every every player that I, um, every team that I coach, uh, let's put it this way, every team that I coach, one of the first few questions I will ask them is, um, what is the ambition in football? What do they want out of this? You know, um, especially I'm talking about elite level. I'm talking about play, uh, teams, players who plays in a competitive, um, uh, competitively. Mm. And um, I always ask them this and um, and I, 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 I will tell them that you must have one because you can't be playing competitively without an ambition. You can't. Um, and once I know what they want, then um, then it's easier for me to work with them and get the best out of them. And I try to um, to work with them collectively, but at the same time uh, individually. So, for example, I'll take uh, a boy, uh, ideal, um, who who has uh, uh, the ambition to play for national level, uh, professional clubs. Um, I would treat him in the uh, in the most uh, stricter way and push them a little bit harder um, in training uh, demand much much higher stuff and then let's say there's another kid who who prob who okay who has a parents that uh, wants them to do well in studies but and so how I would do is I'll ask them to um, to, to try to work for sports scholarships you know and uh, and push them towards that side and despite I mean sorry um, Inst uh, not just asking them to work uh, harder in the pitch but I also tell them to, to get their studies right because you're working for s I mean you're trying to get for sports scholarship you can't go with all fails all ease you know so yeah you have to approach things a bit differently mm. now uh, with, with, the, with the player now slowly being assimilated into the squad how does the s in, your, in, in your views how did the squad um, how do I put it uh, look at the player do they treat them with that respect or do they go you're my teammate I don't care where you're going to go I want to play together with you How, what, what's, the, what's the general air of it once you select these kind of players you're going to bring them out I think they have respect they have mutual respect uh, and, and the other kids when they know um, one kid has the potential to go somewhere um, they all actually feel good about it because they know wow we've got a good, good player in our team and, um, and then what I'll do is I'll try to um, psychologically uh, talk. I mean, I, I try to work with their psychology and try to tell, you know, try to make them think like, okay, now you've got one of the best player here. If not in the, if not state, it's probably the country. And um, your job is to try to be better than him, uh, better than him. So that's a competition, eh? you know? So imagine what you can do if you can get to this boy's level or better than him. Imagine where, where can this get you? So uh, it's just work, you know, just, um, talking to them pushing them this way and yeah usually it works usually it works mm. okay little, little bit of the reverse now chris what happens yeah. to the team and the squad and the mentality when a player like that leaves the team to go and play at the higher level is there any impact on how the team reacts then um 
I will always, I, I, I mean, before, and I will always do this, I will always remind them that what's our project, what's our, what's our main aim. Uh, our main aim, like what you mentioned just now, is not just to not just winning uh, Air Asia Junior League or this local competition. Our main aim is to get get you to uh, where you aim to be. Um, and you know, everyone here is an individual project, not just a collective project. Everyone here is an individual project, all different projects. And no matter who goes first, who goes away, best best player goes away. Um, it's all about you getting to where you need to go. So uh, it doesn't affect much. It doesn't affect much in their head at all. So when I did left the team. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. When Ideal left the team, it didn't affect much at all. It's like I always look at it, and other kids also look at it this way, that when one one player leaves, it's an opportunity for another player to step up and take the position. So it's just like that. Mm. So there's always that chase for healthy competition, uh, you're oh trying yeah. to say? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Mm. And that's that's actually a good motivation for these young boys because you're, you're looking at uh, boys and girls. Uh, you're looking at uh, you're coaching kids who are what, under 12, under 13s. Is quite an important stage of development as uh, football players uh, in the grassroots level. I mean, obviously, in every different age group has a different pivotal stage where they have to go through in terms of their development. And But under trials is when, I, I feel like, in my opinion, is where you start to mature as a player and you have that, sl- you, you slowly find your style. And that's the one where you kind of make it into a habit going into 13s, 14s, 15s, 16s, and then eventually professionally if they choose to go to. Um, so it's quite a pivotal role uh, these these boys and girls will have to play at that point. And you having to instill this in their heads is even better in terms of maturing them as players in general because then they will know like, you know, the team doesn't just revolve around the player. It revolves around everyone who's looking as a unit. And that's great. Uh, that being said, we, we, we had enough of talk about the players. Let's talk about parents just one simple question to you in malaysia is a very well-known stigma that the sports industry is something i wouldn't say a taboo but it's more of something that is very discouraged by parents to kids who want to have a career there um what would you do to convince um parents of today to think about going into sports as a career um, first of all, I, I completely understand the parents' concern for their for their kids to make uh, sports as a full time career, um, and uh, the the usual thing is um, is like the parents will ask what will what what will happen if you don't make it or if you're injured and you can't play anymore and etc uh, etc et right. Um, well, I mean, I'm not a parent, so I don't really know how to answer uh, this question. But I'll give you my take, which is um, it's easier said than done, but anything is possible, right? So. Um, the, the the thing that parents want is their kids to have a stable job and good income. That's the um, they want job security. They want security in their life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so why not uh, for why not parents um, encourage their kids to have a plan B when if they decide to go for a sports as a career, make a deal with your kid and say you gotta have a plan B. I'll let you go and do your uh, you know to to pursue your sports dream, but at the same time you give me back, which is uh, by having a plan B. What plan B? Plan B can be a getting getting a degree as simple as that. Uh, there's so many um, uh, online courses or sorry part time courses and things like that that they can do, and um, yeah, get them to do it. So if if they refuse, if the kid refuses to to get a plan B, then don't allow them. So you gotta make it a deal with them, make it a win win situation. You know. Right. So right. yeah, just like that. Uh, that's that's what my that's my take on it. Yeah. Uh, Andy, what about you? Yeah, I think that um, actually I wrote a, a LinkedIn article about this um, last week and it was about, you know, parents striking the right kind of balance with their kids. Um, we, we get it a lot with, with parents talking about how their kids need to take a break from from training or from football for a couple of months whilst they focus on their exams. And, you know, I, I think it's completely looked at around the wrong way. Um, there's always time for kids to exercise, right? There, there's it's not healthy for a kid to spend all day at school, come home, study, stop for dinner, go back to study, stop to go to bed, wake up and do it the next day. That's not, that's not a healthy way. And I I genuinely don't think the kids learn best that way either. I think you need to break it up. So I think it's about proper planning. And I think up to a certain level, it's, it's quite possible to do both. Now, if you get to that 
13, 14, 15 years old and you are making progress and you have been recruited for national team selection and stuff like that, then you're going to have to start devoting a, a little bit more time towards your sports, right? That's, that's going to have to be um, a prerequisite. You know, um, you don't make national level players who don't sacrifice a little bit of their study time. That is a fact, right? I mm. truly believe that. Um, but at the, at the same time, it's, it's the parents' role to make sure they don't completely give up on, on their studies um, and make sure they are still doing it because you never know when an injury might happen and strike you out. Um, so it's, it's about being um, balanced in, in everything that you do and giving yourself those two options and, and having a fallback option for as long as you possibly can. You know, if you get to 17, 18 and you're giving, given a pro contract in a club, it's unlikely you it's unlikely you're going to do a university degree at that time right right but you want to have your education to as high a level as possible because like i just mentioned you never know when your career is going to come to an end that's the thing about being a professional sports person not just football any sports person right um you never know when it's going to end so it is difficult i totally understand parents concerns um but you know there is there is ways to to do it and like the, the scholarships that chris was talking about is is fantastic if you can get on one of those it's it's obviously the the best option i know chris has got experience of sending um kids off on those those kinds of programs now um and that's obviously the best way to do it in my opinion right but i think most things can be achieved they just need to have a balance and and parents and kids need to talk to each other about it i think at the times when you start needing to to decide which to spend more time on, I think the kids should be old enough to have a say in it. You know, mm. I think, you know, they can't be left to make the decision by themselves at the age of 14 or 15, but I think they deserve to be heard and listen to what they want to do. Um, and I think probably not enough 14 and 15 year olds do get a chance to have an input on where they want their life to go. Um, it's just about striking that balance and i think it's the parents responsibility to support the kids wishes and at the same time making sure that they do have that plan b that chris was talking about right uh this is for me quite pivotal because uh, on the part of the podcast because i feel like you hit the nail right there um many parents fail to see this especially in the um i, I think very much in this setting of malaysia um i i'm very sure chris that chris and i kind of share the same sentiment in terms of how our parents brought us up uh, when it comes to sports um, but it was very much uh, growing up for myself it was very much a no means no kind of thing when it comes to parents being an, authori an authority figure I never had a say in what I had to, uh, I had to do um, so for a good period of time I was taught to listen to what my parents had to say if they, because they had better intentions for me um, obviously that's not the case and um, as I grew older I kind of saw that and I went look I've got to put my foot down uh, and make my decisions as well um, that being said uh, parents are now starting to get a little bit more understanding in terms of how um, their kids want to grow up because as much as you want to mold them into the person that you want to see them as a parent um, I think it's also important to have the kids shape themselves with your guidance uh, don't you think sorry say again what's the question again no I, I, that wasn't a question that was more like a wrapping up <laughs> statement from myself <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just I'll just yeah. add on to that because obviously you two are not fathers yet but I am I have a three yeah. year old son and um, I see that I see this potentially be an argument between my wife and I in, in years to come because my wife is, is Indian Malaysian for, for her and her family. It's unacceptable for Damien to be anything other than a lawyer, doctor or accountant, uh -huh, um, the whole Trinity. which I don't think he will be either one of those just from the first three years <laughs> of, his, of his life. Um, I, I, I think he, he might well want to pursue not necessarily sport, but something more creative. Um, I think he's got that kind of personality about him. Um, and I full heartedly, uh, you know, agree with supporting whatever he wants to do. Um, it'd be great for me if that was football, if he if he decides to follow football in some form. Um, it may not be, but I, I'm, I'm happy to back him with whatever he wants to do and, and make sure that he has the support that's needed. At the end of the day, I'm sat here with a career in football. So who am I to tell him that he can't do that? Right. I, I think I've got to. I've got to help him do whatever he wants to do. And I, I think that parents should be a bit more like that. Um, 
but of course you have to deal with your uh, surroundings as well like the opportunity to make uh, money in sport in Malaysia is is quite limited you know e even if you go on to play um, pro football um, your earning power is is not is very very unlikely to be enough to set you up for the rest of your life you know if you compare that to being in Europe right now if you get a pro contract to play football at the age of 18 19 with a a first or even a second division club in most leagues, you're pretty much set for the rest of your life. You never really have to worry about money again. So it's a lot harder to have those those discussions, I think, with parents in this part of the world, uh, partly because of, of people's views and opinions on education, but also because of what the sporting scene can actually provide to people that are playing it. It's a lot more difficult. Um, so it's, I, I understand parents being concerned and I would always want uh, my son to have uh, as solid a backup plan as you can have but life is not about guarantees right there's, no, there's nothing guaranteed in this yep. in this life uh, just look at the scenario we're in right now right no one hmm. could have could have uh, um, expected us to be locked down and in our homes for the past eight nine weeks whatever it's been now um, thing, things happen in life and I think you just have to roll with what comes your way so uh, again it goes back to being about balance as far as I'm concerned that being said, uh, we roll back to the next question, actually, uh, which is about those players who already have started to play professionally. Um, Chris, yep. uh, these players who are under your tutelage, uh, have they come back to you to kind of tell them, tell, tell you how, how they have been doing so far? And uh, have, um, I wouldn't say, it sounds very, um, how do you say this, very narcissistic for me to ask you this, but um, have they actually come to thank you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. About yeah, they have. About. Yeah, they have. Um, uh, I get these occasional messages um, on or calls sometimes from these players that have moved on to the higher level. Uh, at times, I even get messages from their parents. So, uh, so parents, uh, parents and players are quite thankful for, um, for for what happened and the kids have gone on to a higher level. So yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Mm. Um, final question for this topic of the episode, uh, yeah. Chris. What would you like to see in the future of grassroots football in the next 10 years? The future in of Malay grassroots football. In Malaysia? Yeah, in Malaysia. In Malaysia? Well, um, as simple as this, um, more good quality grassroots coaches. That's all I think. Um, uh, that would be... Uh, I, want, I would like to see more, more good grassroots coaches uh, around. Yeah, in Malaysia, definitely. Uh, Okay, that being said as well, um, mm. you have an AFCB uh, license. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you were doing your AFCB licenses or C, your DC uh, licenses, do you think the um, format or the knowledge that is being provided in those papers are enough to see a good set of coaches be set out? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, the courses... Um, Courses don't teach you how to coach. The courses don't teach you how to coach. The courses are there just as a very, very, um, in my opinion, in my opinion, it's a very basic guideline. Um, when I went for my C license, uh, I remember uh, most of the things that are being uh, presented during the C license are all something I already knew. Um, and then uh, when, when I went for my B license, it's the same. Uh, it's something that I already knew. So, um, so co coaching courses uh, is not enough to to help a coach to progress not at all it just gives you a little bit of um, certification and also a little bit of confidence or when you go out there and you talk or when you do your session but um, number one for me for coaches to to get better um, is the hunger to learn uh, and then to go out and do it to go out and uh, coach and just and just now what Andy mentioned is mentorship. I think mentorship is uh, be having a mentor is um, is probably the most important thing because at least you will learn from the mentor some things that you know you don't have to learn yourself making the mistakes yourself and trying to figure out what's the um, right thing or what's the wrong thing. When you have a mentor, it kind of um, it helps you uh, gives you a little bit of shortcut when you know with certain things like you don't um, you know that certain mistakes that you don't have to do to know what's uh, what's wrong or what's right with it. So yeah, something like that. In my opinion, the the coaching badges are a marketing uh, marketing tool for coaches. Um, 
you arrive somewhere with your UEFA B, AFC C, UEFA A, whatever it may be, and you go, I have a UEFA B, therefore I command this much respect or this much salary, whatever it may be. Um, this is a trap that all employers fall into, I think, including myself. Um, you see a, a qualification on paper and you automatically make assumptions about what that coach must be, what they must be able to deliver. Uh, but the reality with coaching and with our profession is you have no idea until at the very least they get out on the pitch. But realistically, you're looking at a six to 12 month window of assessment to see how good a coach actually is, right? A piece of yeah. paper can never tell you that. And if you compare it to like doing your, your exams, your, your O levels, your SPMs, whatever they may be, uh, you're going to revise that particular subject for three, six months, or if you're like me, like a week before the exam. Uh, you're going to cram all that knowledge in, you're going to take the exam, and then you're going to try and forget about all that information straight away. Um, yeah. And you can get into the same trap with coaching licenses as well. Like you can learn in interesting stuff on them. But until you get out into the field and apply them and practice them, you don't really take that on board and grow as a coach, right? So they're nice to have. Everybody should go through them as a coach. Like, don't don't get me wrong. It's not that you should just ignore your badges and not do them. You, you should. Um, but they should also be taken with a little bit of a pinch of salt to, to indicate what kind of level a coach is at. And I've seen examples of that on both spec spectrums where a coach comes in with a high qualification has been absolutely terrible. Uh, and a coach comes in with very small qualifications that actually is very good. And it's, it's very, very wrong to judge somebody that way. So they are what they are. Um, never read too much into them. All right. Uh, that being said, more hope for grassroots coaches to come out to be better in the next 10 years. And there's so many ways for you to do it. Um, uh, we move on to the final segment of the podcast which is my favorite part of the podcast called ask soccer 60 where we bring you questions that you've given us to andy and chris uh andy and chris have not seen these questions before only i have hence why i said this is my favorite part of the podcast um if you have any questions don't forget to send it over to us at little league soccer malaysia m um, sorry, at Little League Soccer MY on Instagram and Facebook. Um, first question is going to be from our very own Coach Nazgrin. Um, we never really, we we actually never really touched on this before. But Chris, um, yeah, what inspired you to be a football coach? This is from Coach Nazrin. What inspired me to be a football coach? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Right? I mean, I love the game. I love the game, but I, um, um, so I actually, nothing really, I think it's just the game, there's no one on anything that have actually inspired me like, oh, I should be a football coach, no, uh, I just love the game, um, and I just wanted to get involved with football, and, um, and I went into coaching, and I fell in love with it, you know, and, um, yeah, and, after after for a while um, i realized that i'm actually quite good in teaching and um yeah it just stick with me and everything just worked out so yeah okay in a in a in a in alternate universe right now i'm going to ask you would you have become a teacher if not a football coach uh, after coaching uh, i realized that i actually have some sort of a uh, talent in teaching mm -hmm. i wouldn't go into teaching after coaching because i love the game and i you know it, it worked out for me but if i knew that uh, i was good at teaching before that maybe maybe so yeah. we we might have seen check go chris but not coach chris maybe, <laughs> yeah, <I don't> know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um next question is from uh um, oh, hold on hold on, oh, hold on. Oh. i think like i, I just want to say as well like uh, for me, I was never inspired into coaching. Mm -hmm. um, like we mentioned last uh, couple of weeks ago, how I got into it. It was Boyan that had, had offered me the job and I just did it as a part-time thing. But I did enjoy it as soon as I did it and I loved it. Um, I would say that my I burn out from coaching a bit too much. Um, and that's, that's probably why I'm doing this now rather than coaching. But one thing I will say is that this team of coaches that we currently have coaching for us at Little League um, is, I can 100% tell you, inspiring me to get back out onto the pitch. And, uh, you know, I, I've not been coaching regularly for, for several years now. 
but seeing the ideas that these coaches come up with in the meeting rooms and, and what they're doing now during the MCO period, 100% inspires me to get back out onto the pitch and, and deliver some of the knowledge that the, the game has given me. Um, unfortunately for me, like with a young child and stuff, it's not, not too easy to commit to it regularly at the moment, but 100% when, when my son is, is of the age to be playing uh, regular football and stuff. I, I, I'm going to be back out on that pitch and coaching myself because right. uh, these guys have definitely they've definitely sparked something inside of me to to get back out onto the pitch. And you know, I've been doing bits here and there with our weekend sessions, um, which I've absolutely loved. Uh, even working with the real young ones, the, the under sixes, I absolutely love it. Um, so, I I would I would imagine that it's the same for a lot of coaches that other coaches inspire inspire them when they see what people are doing and, and, and what's possible and the boundaries that some people are pushing so um, if I had to say something that inspired me it would be the current crop of coaches that we have um, I think it's it's on another level from anything that we've assembled before mm. uh, that being said we move on to the next question which is from one of the players um, Casey Clover uh, that's the Instagram name um, but um, she asked uh, who is your favourite under 11s player Chris. <laughs> Favorite under 11s player, all of them. <laughs> all of them. I'm gonna There's throw no in another favorite. question for you. Who is your favorite under 13s player? All of them. <laughs> hey, it's not. Yeah. He's not an amateur. He's not gonna get called on such a leading Absolutely question. Yeah. No, Absolutely no. brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I I just threw no that favorite. question over there just to show him off. Well done. Well yeah. done. Yeah. It's so 100 yeah. right there for diplomacy. <laughs> no, I mean you. You can't have a favorite. No, you can't have a favorite. I mean you've got to, like I was mentioning earlier, right? Every player is an individual project. Uh, you have to treat them all differently. Uh, in a way, sometimes the same, and sometimes you have to treat them differently. It's a, it's a challenge that um, I actually really enjoy, which is the psychological side of things, working with the kids. Um, but yeah, you can't have um, like one favorite that the player gets um, the attention, you know. No, no, it's just some kids, they might realize that I would treat them in a um, more, um, a little bit more, uh, how do you say, nice, nicer way. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but nicer way. Mm. But uh, some kids will realize that um, I'm, I'm a bit more harder on certain other kids. And not because I like this more than the other ones. It's actually more that... I know this boy will actually um, uh, strive on a more um, nicer uh, feeling with me and uh, another kid would actually like it when I provoke them, you know, uh, like it when I, when I challenge them, when I keep telling them to prove me wrong. Some kids enjoy that, some kids like uh, compliments, some kids like, um, sometimes like criticism. So, so um, yeah, yeah, it's like that. No favorites, basically. No, um. no, no favorites. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I would just jump on that as well, and I would I would hazard a guess that that's probably one of the main things that Chris learned from Coach Lally down in Singapore. Um, one thing uh, he was exceptional at was uh, was man management and knowing how to get the right reactions out of each kid. Mm. And to most people from the outside, and maybe even within the squad, that may appear that he has favorite kids because he speaks nice to them and treats them better or differently compared to the other kids but in actual fact it's it's the assessment of what that kid needs to hear at that particular moment i think that's something that chris really picked up from laddie and i think that's what he's kind of alluding to now as well right right uh final question for chris um how important is it as a coach to develop positive relationships with the parents of your team positive relationship with the parents um mm-hmm. It's important, uh, it's actually very important, I would say, um, because for a kid to have a success, probably in any field, um, but I'll speak on, uh, for football, for a kid to have any success, um, it's, a, it's, a three, three tri- it's a triangle thing, it's a three-way um, between the coach, um, the player, and the parent. And um, there's, there must be really good uh, communication between the coach and the players, coach and the parents, to be on the same page um, all the time to, to help the players to, to get to where they want to go, to get to the next level. Mm. Um, if, if, the, if the parent and the coach doesn't have a good relationship, then you're basically um, having, um, then you're basically having like, um, like the, the child will probably have two coaches sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So uh, you'll get um, 
the 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 father or the mother will actually start commenting about something that you shouldn't do this shouldn't do that and the coach will say something else but if the if the parent and the coach is always on the same page um you, the the player will always get um the same message more or less some, most of the time okay yeah okay um yeah and i th- i think as well like when um when the the parents and the coach are not on the same page that's when i get problems <laughs> so <laughs> it's always nice for me when the parents and the coaches are on the, on the same wavelength and i like honestly 99% of the 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 problems i get um come to me is when the coach and the parents have not had a proper line of communication that, that's almost inevitably what causes any issues um so it's is so important and i got one question to ask of chris before you cut me off henry okay one of my own right so the last two weeks we've been speaking with simon and kesh who have given us great insights as to the differences between teaching uh boys and girls teams and and what that means to them but you are actually probably the coach that we've got with the most experience that has had of integrating the two and you obviously had a squad that that consisted of of two girls for quite a long period of time and they were very pivotal members of that team so how would you say um it works combining boys and girls and what sort of challenges does it does it um provoke um well i i look at it this way right um when the girls when the girls that wants to play um serious football or competitive football of course they have some sort of ability um the but usually the biggest challenge for the girl is psychologically um is that they always have the men- uh, mindset that oh they are a girl and being in the girl and uh, being uh being with the boys it's a little bit different um they you know uh, they, they tend to have a little bit of mentality like oh i cannot get hurt i cannot get tackled this and that so one of the f- um <laughs> one of the first thing i would ask i would tell the the female players that joins the team or comes into the team that I won't treat you any differently than the boys. Um if you if you want to play um if you want to play at the higher level, the better level, you've got to be able to compete with the boys. Yes, the boys are a little bit more physical, the boys are going to be um uh faster and everything, but um but you know, if, if you can compete with the boys, if you can get better than the boys, imagine what it will do for you when you play against other girls, you know. So, mm. yeah, yeah, it's just um it's it's not so much of a challenge i really don't i really don't treat them any different honestly i don't treat the girls any different when it comes to training um, they get the same treatment uh, as uh, the boys do so yeah yeah it's, that's just how and i work with it final tag along to that question and then henry you can wrap us up after this um, thank you you had had those two girls that we're talking about in your team from 10 11 years old something like that um uh, both of them were with me with uh from 11 one of them from when they were, she was 11 another one was from 13 14 something like that I can't remember okay, so, yeah, so yeah. let's yeah. say from 11 yeah. through to um about 14 15 when they went on to pursue their yeah. their sports scholarships that we were talking about yeah. obviously that's a a very interesting period of kids lives and the differences that they're they're going through in terms of maturity and their their bodies changing and stuff like that how did it affect the relationship between the boys and the girls in the teams from from those ages of 11 through to 14 15 the relationship with the boys in the team yeah was there any sort of changes as they got older mm, no no actually no as uh, i was i'm actually quite uh, surprised uh, when um the girl played in a boys team the boys didn't really look at her like a girl and uh, the girl didn't look at the boys like okay i need to be oh I, this is too too much for me i can't do it no i mean everything we just looked at it as football we didn't look at it as you're a boy you're a girl you're playing football so i yeah. i I slightly disagree because i definitely saw some of your 15 year old boys looking at them as the <laughs> girls now no i mean i think off the pitch maybe they do i don't know but on the field in training in match um, no the the yeah. the boys actually treated her i mean uh, like a boy i mean in a way um and it but it helps when the coach is constantly reminding them that um uh that and and actually shows it through actions as well that this the sport itself is football it's not um, football for boys or football for girls the yeah. football the, the sport itself is football and what is required to play football is this 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 not if you're a boy you play it like this if you're a girl you play it like that you just put it out all together in one and say football is like that you don't change the way right so yeah right. and that's it um 
Is that is that the answer that you were looking for, Andy, or were you just uh, did, did you want, so, want I wasn't that? looking for any answer. That's the <laughs> answer that Chris gave. So that's the <laughs> answer. Uh, and that pretty much wraps it up nicely for us at episode six of Soccer Sixty. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining in uh, no this show today. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe to us on uh, on YouTube and also rate us on your favorite podcasting platforms. Um, if you have any feedback, please don't set, don't don't hesitate to send it to us at all uh, to the podcasting platforms. And most importantly, is follow us on our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer My on Facebook and Instagram. Stay tuned next week where we speak to Gareth Davies. And until next time, this has been Soccer Sixty. See you guys next week. Oh, 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 oh